Thank you so much for joining us today for Top 10 Tactical Tips for Giving Tuesday. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm glad to be your presenter for today's webinar and your host. We are joined today by Robert Wu who is the CEO of CauseVox, a leading crowdfunding platform for nonprofits and social good projects. He has raised over $200,000 for his own social good crowdfunding projects, and his work has been recognized by the New York Times, CNN, Forbes, and the Wall Street Journal. We are really glad to have him joining us. He has presented at places like the Nonprofit Technology Conference, South by Southwest, and the Clinton Global Initiative. So he will be sharing some of his expertise on what you can do to have a successful Giving Tuesday campaign for your organization this year. And you will see on the back end joining us with chat, Ali Bezdikian, TechSoup's interactive video and events producer. She will be there to help you throughout. We are here at TechSoup's headquarters. Rob is traveling right now, so he's in a hotel room in Nevada joining us for this webinar. We're glad to have him there. Feel free to chat in to let us know from where you're joining today. While you do that, I'll do a quick introduction of TechSoup. We'll have some poll questions where we can gauge what you, our audience, have experienced with Giving Tuesday in the past and what role you sort of will play in it. We'll have Rob go through his 10 tactical tips for planning and, and success of a Giving Tuesday campaign. We'll share some crowdfunding and additional resources and have time for Q&A. TechSoup is a global nonprofit with 63 partners worldwide serving 650,000 nonprofits in 121 countries. We are everywhere you see a dot on this map, soon to be serving people in 194 countries within the next few months. So we're really excited to be everywhere in the world that's not embargoed. And we have served organizations with donation programs, technology grants, to the tune of nearly $5 billion. So I'm proud to not only have been a TechSoup user before coming to TechSoup, but also TechSoup staffer. You can learn about our programs at TechSoup.org. So on to the topic of the day. What role are you in at your organization? And this is just to help give us and Rob a little bit of insight into you know, are you coming at this from a position of being in the fundraising team or development person? Are you a decision maker, leadership person at your org? Are you on the communications or marketing team? Or maybe you run the social media. Maybe you're an IT staff person, or maybe you run programs for your organization and you are helping with fundraising as well. Are you joining us from a library today? Or perhaps you work in the administrative office. And of course, like many small nonprofits, charities, nonprofits, libraries, churches, maybe you wear many hats at your organization. And if there's something I'm not including, go ahead and include it in the comments in the chat. I'll give just a few more seconds to allow everyone on the line to participate. We have about 100 people on right now. And then I will show the results. You should be seeing them once you click Submit. You should be able to see those results moving around on your screens as well. I have some people commenting that they are the only staff person. Another person commenting that they are on the fundraising committee. We realize you can't see the comments that are coming into the chat window. But if you, if you have experience with Giving Tuesday, or you have successes or things to avoid that you've had happen to you before and you want to share those. And we think that's valuable information. We'll also share that back out with the rest of our audience. Some folks are commenting that they're a nonprofit consultant. One person says they're an executive director. Another person comments many hats, mainly library, fundraising, and admin. So I'm going to go ahead and show the results. A third of you wear many hats at your organization, which is not surprising. Having worked in small nonprofits, I've been in that same position of wearing many hats in many different roles. And almost another third are doing fundraising and development work, and another 20 are leadership and board. So that's helpful to know. Now have you participated in a Giving Tuesday campaign in the past? And we're kind of casting a wide net with this. Maybe your organization has not had a campaign, but you've helped promote Giving Tuesday, or you've donated to a Giving, camp Giving Tuesday campaign in the past. Uh, go ahead and click on your screen and let us know. And again, this is just to gauge kind of who's got which kind of expertise. If most of you have not, then maybe we'll spend a little more time covering some of the basics. And if most of you have, then that would change our results. So 65% have not participated in Giving Tuesday in the past. So we're happy to have you on and hope to help you plan a campaign that can help your organization earn some great new funding for the end of year campaigns. Last question, are you looking for a fundraising platform? Now before you click on this, just know that if you are, that we will share your information with 
Rob and Cosbox for a one-time email that they can send to you to ask if you'd like to opt in for more information. If you're not, that's okay too. But go ahead and click on the screen. And we don't like to share anybody's information without uh, having your explicit permission. And even if we do share your info, you would get a, a one-time email to say, here's some information about Cosbox. Let us know if you'd like to subscribe to get more. And Causebox is a donor partner of TechSoup, and I'll talk a little bit briefly at the very end of the webinar about the offer that they make for nonprofits and libraries. It's available to you for their fundraising platform. So just a couple more seconds, and I will show the results here, and then we'll move on to having Rob take us through his top 10 tactical tips. So thank you for responding to that. And let me go ahead and just pop us into Rob slide, Slides and welcome him to the program. Thank you so much Rob for sharing your expertise today. We're really glad to have you on. And as somebody who uh, has really personally run a lot of successful campaigns, and online campaigns especially, but also been involved in Giving Tuesday and helping other organizations do so, we're really happy to have you joining us. Welcome to the program. Thanks Becky. Thanks so much for the intro. Um, so really excited today just to share with you guys more about Giving Tuesday. As Becky said, a lot of the uh, insights that I'm going to share today are from my own crowdfunding experience, uh, raising funds not only for nonprofits but social good projects, but also looking at the uh, 35, 40,000 campaigns on our platform and seeing what they do for crowdfunding and online fundraising as well as what they do for Giving Tuesday. So with that, we came up with 10 tactical tips. So really excited just to share with you so you guys can uh, really get started with Giving Tuesday this year um, as well as to make it a success. So um, Becky had a great intro. You know, my name is Rob Wu. I'm the CEO of Cosvox. Uh, Cosvox is a crowdfunding platform as well as a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platform for nonprofits and social good projects. And nonprofits use our online software to easily create fundraising websites. And then they use these fundraising websites for crowdfunding campaigns, donation pages, and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns. Uh, our platform features very easy customization. So a lot of you are small nonprofits who will wear many hats. So you can easily change the look and feel of your campaign site without needing to know how to code as well as without an IT team. So it's really built for the small nonprofit or the small library. So you can have a powerful enterprise level tool with, with a price point that you know, doesn't really break the bank. But even though we are an online software, we like to say that we're more than that. At Cosvox, we help organizations that do good do even more good in the world, from saving abandoned babies to educating kids in Africa to protecting the environment. Uh, we empower people like you to really change the world. Um, our whole goal is to have you guys spend less time on fundraising and tech so that you can spend more time on your mission. Uh, at the end of the day, we're not just about helping people raise funds. We're about helping people uh, do good things and have those good things flourish. So let's jump into it. Um, I do apologize that some of the text on our slide deck today is a little wonky. Uh, this is mainly from, uh, from the fonts being used. Uh, if you do have trouble with PowerPoint that is being provided, uh, feel free to uh, let us know, and we'll be happy to uh, help you get that clarified. Um, so what is Giving Tuesday? It sounds like you know, all of you are interested in learning about Giving Tuesday. Around 70% of you haven't launched the campaign before. 30% of you have had or participated. So uh, this will be a great overview section of what Giving Tuesday is. Uh, so Giving Tuesday, what it is, is three years ago, uh, the 92nd Street Y in New York City and the United Nations Foundation uh, was trying to figure out how they can bring back the spirit of the holiday season and really cut through the noise of retail, of, of Black Friday, of the post-Thanksgiving uh, push that retail stores have. So they created Giving Tuesday, which is a one-day annual um, movement focused on charitable giving. So in the three years since Giving Tuesday has been around, the campaign has engaged more than 30,000 organizations all around the world and raised more than $45 million among nonprofits worldwide. Uh, in last year, collective reporting from a segment showed that around 36% it, uh, showed an increase in 36% of online giving compared to the previous year and a 63% 63, 63 increase in total donations. So Giving Tuesday has been growing like crazy, and it's wonderful that you guys are here today just to learn a little bit more. 
so from the high level, we've seen like a lot of success in giving Tuesday, uh, but from more of the nonprofit level, we've seen like a lot of great successes as well. Uh, for example, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. They're a small nonprofit based in Austin. And what they do is they um, provide, they, they fight against domestic violence through calls and chats and services that they provide to um, to people. So last year they launched a campaign on CauseVox, which is what you see on the screen, and they raised over $52,000 uh, for some of their services and programs. Uh, from a smaller level, we've also seen some success too. From the first time nonprofit, uh, Great 2K, uh, they, what they've done is last year for Giving Tuesday, their whole goal was to set a $5,000 goal for Giving Tuesday. But at the end of it, they doubled that and raised more than $10,000 through Giving Tuesday. So there's been a lot of great success from organizations that are well known, organizations that are not well known, organizations that are small, as well as organizations of all shapes and sizes. But in order to do Giving Tuesday correctly, in order to really see the success, there come some challenges. Um, some of you might be thinking, how do I really start a Giving Tuesday campaign? Uh, based on the poll that Becky provided, around 70% of you are probably asking that since you haven't done a Giving Tuesday campaign before. For others of you are saying, hey, you know, we've done a Giving Tuesday campaign in the past, and we really need to take our Giving Tuesday campaign to the next level. So you're trying to really take it from point A to point B to increase how much you raise, increase your impact, and increase how you guys really run the campaign. As well as some of you might be asking, hey, you know, we're a small nonprofit or we're a small library and we don't have a lot of resources. I wear many hats and how do I really focus my time so I can really cut through the noise? Well, I'm glad that some of you might be asking those questions uh, because today we're going to go over the 10 tactical tips that you can do right now in order to really make Giving Tuesday a success this year. Uh, just moving forward a little bit, uh, before we dive into the 10 tactical tips, uh, I know that I may be a little short on time, so I do apologize if I speed through things. Uh, we will pause in the middle uh, after tip five to ask um, you guys if you have any questions as well as we'll have some um, time at the end for any questions that you have. Uh, we have some free resources too that I want to give out in the beginning since I know that some of you may not be able to stay the whole hour. Um, the first one is uh, we have a Giving Tuesday Resource Center. It's causevox.com slash Giving Tuesday Resources. Basically has a free ebook on how you can plan a Giving Tuesday campaign, uh, weekly tips that you can subscribe to, um, as well as a weekly newsletter that you can subscribe to as well. Um, plus, we'll be launching a video series uh, on Giving Tuesday tips. Uh, all this is free, so feel free to take a visit if you have a chance. So let's dive into it. All right, so tip one for the top 10 tips. Um, tip one would be to set an impact metric. <laughs> I do apologize again for, for the font. It looks so funny from my end. Um, so what is an impact metric? So a lot of times uh, when we're running a fundraising campaign or crowdfunding campaign, we get too involved in how much we need to raise. The dollars. Uh, what we've seen is that um, when people run an order, a campaign on a cause box, at least, um, a lot of the donors don't really care about how much you're being raised. They really care about what the impact is that you will have through your campaign. So one thing that we encourage all organizations to do is to rethink the perspective that they have on their campaign, to shift it from raising a certain amount of dollars to move towards a certain amount of impact. So for example, World Bicycle Relief, this is a nonprofit based in Colorado. And what they do is provide bikes to people in, developing, in the developing country so that they can get to school faster, so that they can get to work faster. And they found that it costs around $100, $150 to provide one bike to one person. So instead of saying uh, we need to raise half a million dollars, such as in this screenshot, uh, they're saying we want to count the number of impact that we're having as part of our campaign. So for their fundraising campaign, uh, for every $150 that's donated, then it'll count an additional unit of impact. You can actually take this unit of impact and then set a goal, and then people that support you, board members, supporters, and donors, can actually take a look at that and say, hey, I want to support three bikes or five bikes 
as a way for them to donate. Another example, uh, we have Team Christian over here. Uh, this is a this is just a social good project that someone created for a neighbor. They raised funds for medical expenses, and they did the same thing too. So for them, they were trying to aim for uh, physical therapy sessions for the young child that needed it, and um, they set a goal. Um, they set an impact metric, and then um, the impact metric really counts the impact that they've been having. So for you guys, in order to set an impact metric, there's three easy steps. So the first step would be to identify the unit. Um, so figure out what is the unit of impact that you want to create. Um, if you're a library, it could be the number of books that you want to provide. If you're a uh, clean water organization, it could be the number of wells that you want to dig. Um, if you're a, um, a research organization, it could be uh, the number of um, the number of reports that you want to create or the number of tests or trials or studies that uh, can be created through the funds uh, through the campaign. Uh, the second step would be to determine the unit cost. So the unit cost um, is the amount of money it takes to actually uh, service one unit of impact. So if you're a library, it could be $5 per book. If you're a um, a organization serving students and kids. It could be uh, you know, $50 for a project or program. Um, or if you're doing clean water, it could be uh, $25 to serve clean water to one family in the community. So figure out what is the actual cost it takes. And what you can do is you can ask your program manager or your project manager for the budget that they have and then really figure out what is the impact that it had in the past year and then do a simple math, which is uh, cost divided by impact will equal the unit of impact. And then the last step for your Giving Tuesday campaign would be to calculate the goal. The goal would take the, the unit cost times a certain number of impact that you want to create to actually, to actually have um, the goal that you can create for the Giving Tuesday campaign. All right, so that's the impact metric. The second tip would be to use peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So peer-to-peer uh, -peer fundraising is a method of fundraising that leverages your supporters to fundraise on your behalf. Uh, what it does is, uh, let's say you have volunteers, supporters, board members, or even staff. You can get them to create a personal crowdfunding page or a personal fundraising page that is part of your Giving Tuesday campaign. And then what they'll do is they'll send out that personal page to their friends and family through their own social networks, social media, or email to really drive traffic and donations to your campaign site. One of the key benefits that we've seen is that uh, when you use peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, uh, the campaigns on our platform raise twice as much as the regular campaigns without peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So it's a great way to not only extend your reach, but also to drive more traffic and, and awareness about your campaign. Uh, one of the things that's also really beneficial from peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is that um, it allows people to share stories that are highly personalized. So how it looks like um, it more visibly is uh, on your screen you see a, a Giving Tuesday campaign from Project Renewal. Project Renewal is a charity based in New York City, and what they do is they help the homeless get off the streets. Um, so this is Martha. She's on staff with Project Renewal, and she created a personal fundraising page under the Project Renewal Giving Tuesday campaign site on Coswalks and set a goal of $1,000. And you can see that she raised three times as much last year. Um, you can also see that um, you can uh, see the impact that she's, ha she's been having as a result of the $3,000 being raised. So you can use these pages as a way to um, get people to take more ownership of the Giving Tuesday campaign. So you're not just relying on your own um, email list or your own Facebook page that you can really leverage the people that know about your organization to become amplifiers and advocates for you guys. When you look at the campaign site, um, there's also uh, built-in tools when, pe when people use personal fundraising pages, like a leaderboard search tool. So it makes it really fun and easy for people to participate as well. Um, but doing peer-to-peer -peer fundraising uh, isn't just throwing up a campaign site and asking people to join. You also have to shift your perspective too. So if you choose to use peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, one of the things that you should think about is to become a coach rather than a fundraiser. So what this means is really empowering your, your fundraisers to go out there and solicit for donations. And we call it 
that uh, creating a toolkit. So creating one sheets and logos and social media tips that they can have in order to really go out there and raise funds for you guys. Uh, also one of the cool things that we've seen is that on average when people raise funds on personal fundraising pages, uh, they tend to raise around five to $600 per page. So if you think about how many people can get signed up multiplied by uh, that amount, then you can kind of see uh, how many donations and the level of donations that you'll get from using peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. All right. Speeding along, tip number three for Giving Tuesday is to create a campaign-specific Facebook page. So this tip is all about creating a community. Uh, one of the hardest parts of Giving Tuesday um, is to really, quote unquote, own the airwaves, to kind of cut through the noise, to uh, really get your story and your message into, uh, into the eyes and ears of the people that need to hear it. Um, and one of the hardest parts is that a lot of us are small nonprofits. I ran a small nonprofit for, for about four years before Cosvox. And I really understand how that uh, when you're a small organization or a small library, you just have your own channels. You might have a couple thousand Facebook likes, uh, maybe just a couple thousand like Twitter followers, and a couple thousand people on our email list. So it's really hard to get your message across to a wide audience. One of the things you can do is to really focus on a core group of community. So uh, for example, um, there's a campaign on Causewalks that recently ended not too long ago uh, called Moxtropolis. It has a very unique feel to it. Basically, it was started by this board game company in, uh, in Seattle. And they got their community involved in a gaming tournament where companies and individuals would compete um, as part of a board game tournament. And then they would raise funds for a nonprofit called HopeLink based in uh, Washington. So they were able to raise three times as much as the original goal, mainly because they focused so much on building community before they even launched a campaign. Um, so what they did is they created a campaign-specific Facebook page. So this is in addition to the existing Facebook page where they can get people who are, qu who are very vested into the success of the campaign and the people that are, are very passionate about the cause to really join the Facebook page so that they can have a way to not only see who is joining but also to see the demographics behind uh, the people that are very highly interested. When you get people to join a campaign-specific Facebook page, there are a couple of benefits too. Uh, the first one being that um, you get access to Facebook Insights, which is a really handy and free tool so you can see the demographics of people who like that page, the people who support that page, as well as you're able to um, leverage their audience as well. If you decide to use Facebook ads or boost posts, then the people that like your campaign-specific page um, become conduits for you to access their friends and family networks on Facebook. So it's a great way just to spread out the message really easily. Um, and the last benefit too is that it provides a really um, a, a very easy watering hole so that people can get information, get stories about your campaign so they can then share that with their own social networks as well. Now, if you don't have the time or bandwidth to create a campaign-specific Facebook page, what you can do is find alternatives to watering holes. The first one is an email list. This is a very, very simple. Um, so this is kind of the thing that you should have, uh, you should do if you don't have the time to do anything else, which is basically to create an email list. You can do this in Excel. You can do this in, um, in your own e Outlook or Gmail accounts. And then to basically tell people that are part of your community to join the list. Uh, the second alternative that you can do is to create a Facebook group or a Google group. A Facebook group is basically a campaign specific um, Facebook page, but more focused on the people within your own social networks. So it's a lot easier to manage, it becomes more of a discussion community. Uh, a Google group is about, is about the same thing. People can join uh, through email so they can get updates about what's been going on as part of the campaign. And lastly, um, if you are um, looking for something more robust uh, where people can have discussions and have resources and uh, files and articles and things like that, then you can create a base camp. 
Basecamp is a free online tool. It's a project management tool, but you can also use it for uh, discussions, for like a file repository, so you can have and store those campaign toolkits that you give to your peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers. All right. Tip four is to have a call to action. So there was a recent study um, that I read about that basically said that uh, it basically looked at two groups of college students. The first group, um, there were people that were rated by their peers as being generous. The second group were people that were rated by their peers as not being generous. And what they did is they gave a fundraising appeal to the, to the groups. And for a group that was not rated as, uh, for a group that wasn't rated as generous, they gave them a fundraising appeal that has specific instructions on what they should do uh, and to support um, the, uh, the organization. And studies show that the, the group that was given the specific steps to support the organization ended up supporting um, the organization more than a group that was determined as generous. So what that really means is um, that when you have a call to action, when you have an onboarding or an on-ramp, then people would tend to complete the action a lot more. So um, onboarding can really yield more results. So let's take a look at an example. So Never Thirst, their charity uh, on Causewalks that uh, run a lot of crowdfunding campaigns. If you look at this Facebook post, I kind of edited it a little bit. Um, what it says is, what if you knew every dollar you gave matched? Uh, every dollar given towards Wad for Water unlocks one for the same amount of up to $155,000 and it shows an image of, um, of their cause. And that's great, right? You, you can react to the image, you can react to the text, and it's a great story to share. But uh, this story isn't as effective as if you look at, for example, if we put in uh, just a call to action, an on-ramp, and then we say, hey, you can turn a $25 gift into 50 bucks. Will you give today? And then you give a link. Uh, chances are that the people who see this second post with an on-ramp with a call to action would actually click on it and uh, complete the action rather than the first uh, example that I showed you. So in order to create a call to action, uh, there's a framework that we can follow. It's super simple. The first one is uh, you have to find the calling. The calling is basically your cause, your mission, the purpose of your campaign. Um, is it to educate, to provide clean water, to do advocacy or research, you know, what, what is it? What is, the, uh, what is the reason that you guys exist as an organization? And then the second step would be to um, put into action. What do you want people to do? Uh, this is typically like a verb. It's either to share, to donate, or to fundraise. Those are the typical three that we see as part of Giving Tuesday campaigns. So what you can do is you can match um, you know, some type of statement about your impact or, or the problem or the solution that you guys have. Match that with an action that you want people to take, and that can be your call to action. All right. Speeding along, tip number five is to create a unique hashtag. So some of you might not know what a hashtag is, so let's talk about that first. A hashtag is basically a pound symbol. I still call it a pound because how I grew up uh, understanding what a hashtag is. Um, it's used to mark keywords or topics in a tweet. Um, and it's used to create, it was created by Twitter to really organize messages, organize tweets because there are a lot of things going on. So not only can you use hashtags now for Twitter, you can use hashtags for Facebook, for Instagram, as well as like a lot of other social media channels. Hashtag, in another word, is basically a way for you to tag a post so that it becomes very searchable. And for example, uh, Shower Strikes, their campaign on Causewalks that, um, that provides clean water to communities in Africa. And what you see here is a Twitter feed of a, of a Twitter search of the Shower Strike hashtag. So what they do is um, they ask people to include a hashtag in all their posts. So it provides a way for them to not only organize the different conversations going on on Twitter as well as Facebook, but also allows them to engage with the posts that people are posting. So for Giving Tuesday, even though you guys might be using the Giving Tuesday hashtag, you, also, you should also create one for your own so you can easily organize and look at what people are talking about um, as part of your campaign. Um, 
on Facebook, for example, Maria Shriver, uh, she uh, tagged her post with the shower strike hashtag. So just, this is just to show you that hashtags are not limited to just Twitter. And one of the interesting things that we've seen is that when you do use hashtags, uh, especially on social media, then you'll get more engagement. Uh, a study done by Buffer App said that uh, tweets with hashtags receive twice as much engagement, so twice, as, twice as much favorites, or twice as much replies, or twice as much engagement because they use the hashtag, because people, uh, people are able to really organize and see the hashtag um, posts. And the second interesting thing they mentioned was that tweets with hashtag with one or two of them typically receive more engagement. But then if you include more than that, then you actually see a drop in engagement. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to spam people with hashtags. Then it becomes uh, something that's not really relevant and becomes really, really uh, just noise. So what we encourage you guys to do is to use one or two hashtags in your social media posts on Facebook and Twitter. So some tips. So in order to create a hashtag for your own Giving Tuesday campaign, you, ha you have to have three, um, uh, three basic three things. Uh, the first one being is that your hashtag must be unique. So the worst thing you want to do is you come up with a great hashtag when someone else is using it uh, for their own campaign or some other organization uh, has been using it in the past. If you do see that, then it becomes not unique, so it becomes really difficult to really to, for you to see which messages are relevant. So what you can do is you can search on Twitter or use a tool such as hashtag if I me to really see if a hashtag is being used. Uh, the second tip is uh, to be relevant. So for example, in Shower Strike, um, um, the whole campaign is about people not taking showers and raising funds uh, in doing that activity. So they call it a Shower Strike. And it becomes really relevant to their campaign and organization. So you want to figure out a hashtag that is reflective of what, of what you guys do as a nonprofit. And lastly, to keep it short. Um, especially on Twitter, because uh, Twitter is limited to 140 characters. If you have a hashtag um, that maybe, let's say, it's, it's, it's uh, called Giving Tuesday Clean Water 2015, then you're basically taking away half of what someone can actually tweet in a message. So you want to be able to shorten your hashtag as much as possible so it leaves room for not only you, but also your supporters and the people who know about you to include messages in, your, uh, in their social media posts. So we're at tip six, and I just want to pause right here and hand it back to Becky uh, for a short break for questions. Thanks so much for that, Rob. Lots of great tips coming in. And we have quite a few questions in queue. Um, one, just to clarify quickly, the fundraising pages that you were showing some screenshots of earlier, are those built on CauseVox, or are they built on Giving Tuesday's website, or someplace else, or a variety of places? Can you clarify where those live? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the, the screenshots that I'm showing you today are predominantly from campaigns on CauseVox, just because I know about the campaigns, I know about the charities and the great work they're doing. Um, so for the personal fundraising pages, um, that one is a campaign on CauseVox. Um, Giving Tuesday, uh, they're more of a resource, so they don't provide a software or a platform for you to launch a Giving Tuesday campaign. So if you, if you guys are interested, you can check out CauseVox as a handy tool. Great. And uh, we will talk a little bit about tools and resources to find tools, CauseVox included, and others beyond that as well later on too. Um, we had another question. Barry asks, I'm confused. For his recommendation to create a specific Facebook page for each Giving Tuesday campaign, does that mean you'd be starting from scratch with your audience? Should you be creating a website landing page instead? How do you capture your audience if you're creating a fully new page if you run a, a very specific campaign uh, for Giving Tuesday on Facebook? Do you have to rebuild that whole audience? Yeah, that's a great question. So the whole point about um, creating a campaign-specific um, page on Facebook is really geared towards uh, finding out who are your core group of supporters on Facebook or just the core group of supporters for a campaign and having them have a place where they can get resources, have conversations, as well as see specific stories. Your own existing organization Facebook page would be more general. 
So one thing that we do uh, see people do is uh, if they're running a campaign year after year, they'll just create one campaign specific page. For example, uh, Shower Strike has a campaign specific uh, Facebook page. But then as an organization, they have more of a broader organization page called Well Aware World. So when you have your own, you're able to just post messages that are relevant to the community for that campaign. Now, if you're a smaller nonprofit, uh, which I believe most of you are, uh, you might not want to create a campaign specific page because it's creating, managing two pages is too difficult. Or you might not know if you want to use and run the same campaign the next year. So what you can do is you can create a group instead, which is a lot easier. Or you can just create an email list uh, or even a landing page as well and, and then just to use that. So it really depends on what your community really needs and providing them a tool and channel for them uh, so their needs can be met. Great. And kind of piggybacking on that, Portia asks, would a Facebook event suffice in lieu of an entirely new Facebook page? I'm not sure about events. Um, events, maybe. Uh, it depends on kind of your campaign. The, the, the good thing about the event is that you can invite your own social network. But as an organization with the Facebook page, it becomes a little more difficult. You can do that, but then you can post updates to it. Um, but the whole point about creating a campaign specific Facebook page is so you can get insights. So within events, you don't get insights about the people that are going to your, camp, your, uh, your event. But with, Facebook, with a campaign specific Facebook page, you're able to see the age group that people um, are part of the page or how often they post, uh, how many likes you're getting. You're also able to um, post uh, Facebook ads, like boosting posts, so that you can get more awareness and get into the social networks of the people who like the page. Terrific. Well, we do have a lot more to get through in the next few minutes, so I want to move us forward. Don't worry if your question's in queue. We will still have hopefully a few minutes at the end to get to some more, and we'll be helping answer those in chat as well. So let's dive into tip number six. Thanks so much, Rob. All right, tip number six. So let me speed along. It looks like we have a lot of great questions, so I want to make sure we have enough time for that. So tip number six is to post the right type of content on social media. Um, so if you ever looked at um, some of the insights that Facebook gives you, if you go to your Facebook page, then you may be a little disappointed <laughs> because when we look at uh, our own CauseWatch Facebook page, uh, even though we have a number of followers, only a small segment of them actually see the posts that we put on them. Uh, so the those numbers can really shock you compared to how many followers you have or how many emails you have. And one of the things that we've seen is that the key to really winning social media is to post the right content, to post content that is really shareable. So, and we have a really interesting secret, um, and it's this. It's Pac-Man eating a pie. No, just kidding. It's a pie chart that shows you the percentages of what kind of posts that you need. So the first one is that uh, the great majority of the posts should be in educational, entertaining, um, or inspiring. So the majority of your posts that you post on Facebook should be about uh, perhaps an inspirational impact that someone that you serve uh, has had, or uh, the benefit of uh, your programs and projects, or sharing photos and videos and images um, that are very uh, inspirational. It can be also educational, kind of educating your audience about what the problem is that you're trying to solve. And then the other 20% uh, should be salesy. That's kind of what we call uh, action-oriented uh, Facebook posts like donate to my campaign or share this post or advocate or you know, join our event. That 20% which is just the minority of the whole percentage uh, should be more about yourself. So for example uh, of an entertaining post, uh, this is a Project Aware Foundation. Uh, they're a charity on Causevox. Um, they run a campaign called Finathon. And you'll notice that they use hashtag Finathon. Um, and they created an entertaining post. And the post that says, from the shark, how can I keep my reputation as a bloodthirsty killer when you just casually swim beside me? So their whole mission is to help protect the oceans, and one of the things is protecting sharks. So this is an entertaining post because what it does is, is, is there's not a sales component to it. There's not an, a call to action to, for people to donate or for people to kind of give something. It's something to, that uh, is very interesting and educational. An example of another entertaining post is from War Bicycle Relief. 
Um, this is a, a more of a testimonial story from a 13-year-old supporter, and it talks about uh, what she's been doing uh, as part of um, her support for World Bicycle Relief. So kind of entertaining doesn't always have to be humorous. It can be something inspirational. And then very lastly, um, an example of a sales post. We just seen this uh, a few slides ago, uh, basically something that is more about your campaign and your donations. So tip number seven. Uh, is to practice social listening. Social listening is basically a fancy term created by ad agencies to uh, to communicate observing what goes on in social media. Um, so one of the best ways to really figure out how to craft your messages or how to uh, target an audience is basically just to search on Twitter to see what's going on. So one of the things you can do that's free is you can go to search.twitter.com. You can search for hashtag Giving Tuesday, or you can search for um, uh, some certain keywords about your organization or your organization name. So you can actually see what's been going on. As part of Giving Tuesday, this is really valuable because Giving Tuesday there's a lot of social media activity. So one of the things you want to do is to monitor the conversations that people are having about your organization. So not only can you engage back with them through replies, but also you can um, use that as testimonials or you can use that as inspiration to create additional content. Uh, you can also search on Facebook as well. So just go to Facebook.com, log into your account, and go to the search bar, and then you can type in the same keywords or hashtags as um, you type into Twitter, and then you'll see a listing of different posts. So certain queries you should be thinking about. Um, one is hashtags. So definitely search hashtags that are relevant to your campaign or your organization. The second one is to uh, search your organization name to see who's been talking about you. And then lastly is to search for certain keywords. Um, if you're into clean water, you probably want to search clean water. If you're into education, um, then find certain keywords that are about that as well. Um, so you, you can then start to find, okay, maybe there are other organizations using certain keywords, uh, and then you, you can start participating and injecting yourself into that conversation. All right. Tip number eight, speeding along, is to create and post content. So I want to share a few interesting stats with you. Uh, if you're really struggling with cutting through the noise, or if you really want to get more attention, then this tip number eight is really for you. So studies have shown that companies that blog get 55% more traffic. So if you post blog updates on a regular basis, then you'll get 50% more traffic than before. And more traffic means more awareness, and more awareness means more donations. Uh, 36 of consumers say that they share content primarily because it promotes causes or issues they care about. So this means that a third of all people are on Facebook and Twitter so that they can share your content, your posts. So what you need to do is to create amazing shareable content so uh, a third of all of these people can then promote your campaign. Um, if you were to look at um, uh, one example of why sharing posts is important is, uh, let's say um, uh, someone gives you a fundraising letter in the mail. Now, would you actually share that letter with your friends and family? Probably not. You want to share something that's inspirational, something that you really, really feel passionate about. Um, so that's why creating content is important. Um, one of the advice that we got from uh, our charities is called an agile approach to content creation. A lot of times people get hung up on how to create content. They say, hey, you know, we need to create a month's worth of, worth of content. It has to be perfect. But one of the ways to do it is to have an iterative process. So the first step would be to populate content. Uh, Danielle Festa from Great TK says um, she creates a week of content or even a half day of content, um, such as social media posts or blog posts, and then she just puts it out there. And then what, she, then what she does is she reviews and monitors the content. She sees which Facebook, Facebook posts or which Twitter posts or which blog posts get the most traffic and engagement. And then she uh, adjusts her strategy. She says, okay, these three posts are getting the most engagement. So then what I want to do is to create more of the similar type of content. So that's what you can do as well. Tip number nine. So we're almost done, and we'll have some time for some questions. So tip number nine is to follow a storyline. So when you're creating a campaign, um, 
it's not just about asking people to share or donate or to fundraise. Really, it's about telling a great and compelling story. So there's a few storylines from Hollywood that you can actually borrow from to really communicate the work that your organization does. So I want to share with you three of them. The first one is called Overcoming the Monster. This is a story when there is a hero, a protagonist, and they set out to defeat a deadly force or an antagonist that threatens his home or community. So you've probably seen this in a movie like Avengers, when they have the heroes who fight against the aliens and the heroes win, they save New York, everybody's happy. Um, when it comes to a nonprofit, um, Earth Rights International, um, they're a charity on Causebox that raised funds uh, through a campaign before. And they raised over $24,000 because uh, what they do is they fight against corporate rights abuses. So from oil companies abroad uh, abusing uh, the privileges or, or work environment, they fight against that. So what they did is they, they followed the same storyline of overcoming the monster, the monster being uh, the, the big corp corporates out there, and then themselves as being the hero fighting against, um, against the corporations. Another uh, storyline you can follow is called Rags to Riches or the Rebirth. This, this is basically when there's a protagonist that starts out as poor and downtrodden, but then they rise through the world through wealth, status, love, and more. So one of the movies that you guys have seen before probably is called Pursuit of Happiness. This is when a guy named Will Garner, sorry, um, a guy by, by, named Chris Garner, played by Will Smith, um, he uh, competes competitively for an internship and for a full-time job to provide for his family. So he goes from living in a shelter to getting a high-paying job. Um, this is kind of a story that you can use. Uh, Project Renewal, uh, a charity that I mentioned before, uh, featured a story from a guy named Harry. And for the Giving Tuesday campaign, um, Harry spoke about how he was transformed from being homeless to getting a job and getting his own apartment. So it's a story about transformation. And then through that campaign, they raised over $73,000. Um, the other um, storyline that you can follow is called the quest. Uh, the quest is when the protagonist and the companion set out to acquire an important object and they reach a certain destination, but they overcome, um, uh, they encounter perils and overcome those hurdles along the way. So, for example, you've probably seen this in a movie like Wizard of Oz when Dorothy is sent to Oz and meets the scarecrow, the tin man, and the lion, and then has to talk to the wizard to get back home. Uh, for example, uh, we've seen this storyline used in the Gauntlet campaign when they tr when their journey is about uh, raising funds for a nonprofit and they invite the community along in the journey to do that. And the last tip that we have is uh, to use great tools. So there are three tools I want to share with you. Uh, the first one is uh, Pablo. It's a free tool by Buffer. Um, Buffer is a social media scheduling tool. And what you can do is you can easily create uh, images that you can share on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and what we've seen is that these images, uh, when you use them on social media, tend to get more engagement. So it's a super easy way for uh, you guys to create highly engaging content uh, without having to hire a designer. Uh, the second tool that you can use uh, is called Canva. This is another design tool. So you can create toolkits with this. You can create logos and images as well. It's free to use, and they also have a nonprofit discount. And then lastly, uh, to use Cosvox. So we're a crowdfunding platform and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platform that you can easily use for your crowdfunding campaign or peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign uh, without needing to know how to code. And you can easily launch a Giving Tuesday campaign in minutes uh, without having to hire a IT person or a designer. So it's a great way for you guys to raise funds, and we have all the tools that you need, including donation receipts, uh, site settings, a site designer, personal fundraising pages, all that stuff wrapped up into uh, one tool. Um, and very lastly, before I transition it back to Becky, is uh, I just want to put up our additional resources, uh, giving Tuesday resources, uh, causevox.com, as well as you can find our weekly newsletter, gtweekly.causevox.com, to sign up for some tips. So Becky, I'm going to kick it back to you. Thank you so much, Rob. I appreciate you zipping through all of that and hoping to keep us on time. Before I open up to full Q&A, I just want to go ahead and mention, as I said I would do earlier, just talk about some of the Causevox and crowdfunding resources available to you on TechSoup's website. We have um, TechSoup, 
www.cosvox.org slash CauseVox is where you can find out about the CauseVox donation program that substantially discounts their online fundraising and crowdfunding platform for a one-year impact plan subscription or a one-year pro plan subscription. And you can find out more details about either of these and the eligibility restrictions at TechSoup.org slash CauseVox. And that is available to both nonprofits and libraries. So check that out if you are looking for a platform to use. We also have a bunch of resources that we've written and done webinars on in the past. So if you are looking at tools and you want to know which crowdfunding platform is best for your org and you want to use a platform that's out there, there are some free low cost ones. There are some that charge, most of them charge some type of processing fee which is charged by credit card companies and they may add on uh, something to that. So keep that in mind and, and do some comparisons. But we have resources we've created on both giving Tuesday and year-end fundraising strategies. Uh, we have crowdfunding specifically for libraries, talking about which types of campaigns work for that community in particular, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, a lot of different content out here. And I know Allie also just shared out some resources on um, storytelling because we understand that storytelling is one of the best ways to reach your audience and help them kind of really understand the heroes in your own community, in your own work, and what will inspire people to want to open up their pocketbook and donate to your organization with their uh, end of year giving. So again, I'm also just mentioning some other crowdfunding tools in our catalog. So again, the CauseVox Pro Plan and Impact Plan. But we also have tools like Teespring which are available that if you want to try and sell t-shirts for your cause, if you want to have a storefront for your cause, these are also available through TechSoup's catalog as additional tools that um, you can use to help your constituents and supporters help you fundraise and support your cause. And I'm going to open up to the questions that we have in the queue and feel free to ask more. But we also invite you to continue the discussion in our digital engagement forum beyond this one hour that we're spending today. We have folks there that can help answer more questions for you and share their expertise and tips. And this is a great place for you to share your own. We'll include the link to that in the follow-up email. So, Diving into some of the questions in the queue, we had quite a few people early on that were asking about the how to set an impact metric. And so one person mentioned that they are an advocacy or research organization, and you sort of addressed that in one of your answers. Um, we also had somebody ask, well, what if we provide multiple different services? Like we're a domestic violence agency, and so we have a shelter, a hotline, permanent housing programs. How do you pick the best one to use? Or do you use multiple ones? Um, what's your best advice uh, for people when they try and develop impact metrics? Is it to just, just test it out and see what people respond to? Um, and one other person had mentioned on the same vein that they, um, their, their work is more incremental where they are showing steps in a process. And that's kind of the impact that they make is advancing through a process. How do you show the impact metric when, when your goals are a process rather than a final destination? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great questions. So with an impact metric, it can be tricky if uh, what the work that you're doing is more long term, or the work that you're doing is more uh, kind of broad reaching. So one of the things about the impact metric that you can think about is to make it as specific as possible. So even though you might be in a process or you might have uh, dozens of programs, um, you can have an impact metric for each one of them. And what you can do is um, when you launch a campaign for Giving Tuesday, let's say, or a campaign overall for something else, um, you can have a specific impact metric for a specific campaign. So you don't have to use the same one over and over again. Now for Giving Tuesday, because it's a little bit more broad, um, what you can do is you can pick the one that uh, people will most resonate with and the one that you need to raise funds for to use that as an impact metric. Um, if you can't do that, then um, what I do recommend is to uh, look at if there are any kind of proxy measures as a way for you to uh, create your uh, impact metric. So instead of like, directly saying, hey, you know, uh, we're uh, each unit impact uh, is like a person or a bike or a, a day of housing, it could be more about uh, perhaps the number of um, communities being helped or uh, the number of uh, reports being generated or the number of um, uh, kind of 
um, partnerships being created. So that can also work as well. But typically we see that the best functioning impact metrics are super specific related to the direct impact that, you're, that you have as part of your work. Terrific. That answered a whole bunch of people's questions hopefully in brief uh, before ending. Um, I want to go ahead and wrap us up here since I recognize we are at the top of the hour, and I know we started a couple of minutes late, but I'd like to invite you to join us for other upcoming webinars. And thank you so much, Rob, for sharing your 10 top tips and tactics for a successful Giving Tuesday. And we hope that people will take some of this and work through it for your own organization's needs. If you're not on a fundraising or development team and you do have those folks internally, a lot of times you're talking about your impact in every grant proposal that's written for your organization. So connecting with them if you're the social media or marketing person may help you identify some of those impact metrics as well that you can pull out and externalize for your audience when you're doing outreach. So let us know in the chat window what things you've learned today that you may take back and try and implement and work on for your giving campaigns this year and end of year fundraising. Join us next week. We'll be talking about disaster proofing your nonprofit or library technology. It is National Preparedness Month, so we hope you'll join us to learn some key things you can do to better protect yourself and bounce back quicker in the event of any disaster, whether it's a national or natural disaster or a server that goes wrong or an employee that goes wrong, right? After that we'll also be talking with libraries specifically about device checkout and how to manage those mobile devices in your libraries. Then we'll have some time talking about getting started with grant writing and really making those grant re requests sparkle. And this is a webinar that normally is an $89 charge to participate in directly with GrantStation's CEO. So join us for that one. It's a freebie and only available to those of you who attend live. And then we'll be talking about the world of donated and discounted technologies where we're bringing together TechSoup, Independent Sector, and Good360 to talk about all the different ways that you can access donations for your organizations and get uh, discounts and donations that you deserve and need to serve your communities. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you Rob for your time. Thank you Allie for helping on the back end. Join us at TechSoup Global, TechSoup.org, on our Facebook and on our Twitter. And lastly, I'd like to thank ReadyTalk for the use of their platform. They sponsor these webinars by providing this tool for us to use. And you can check out their donation program at TechSoup.org slash ReadyTalk. When you close out, please take a moment to complete the post-event survey and let us know how we're doing and how we can continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you everyone so much. Have a terrific day. Bye-bye.